You're watching Force 13's live streaming service. And now the latest around the wide world of tropics. Tropical Weather Bulletin for August 28th, live. Well, we have a significant situation developing on our hands here with Hurricane Ida now, as well as Tropical Storm Nora. Those two, two systems may be the only ones we have around the world right now, but they pose significant threats to the respective regions that they are in. Ida, of course, being the more prominent threat at this time. 58 storms have formed so far this year as we enter day 40 of the seas, or worldwide year. It's the 89 of Atlantic hurricane season. There's Hurricane Ida there as a category one, 80 mile an hour winds. There's also Invest 97L. We've downgraded that to 50% chance at this time. 98L has an 80% chance, and there's also an AOI in the main development region with the 20% chance of formation as well. It's day 105 of Eastern Pacific hurricane season. There's Tropical Storm Nora there. It is expected to become a hurricane while it enters the Gulf of California, potentially as a 90 mile an hour category one there. Uh, at least from the latest National Hurricane Center cone there, so definitely interesting there. Uh, not many storms make it into the Gulf of California still alive. Anyways, with the Western Pacific is looking relatively dead and has been for the last few days, with no model hinting anything in the near future, so it looks like it's going to be remaining quiet at least for the rest of August. In the North Indian Ocean, it's the same story here, not much going on if at all. Uh, just the usual monsoonal season continuing, and of course, we're not going to be seeing activity pick up for a few more weeks here. Pretty much nothing else really to say, considering the fact I've really been saying that for the last month or so now. Uh, moving on to the Atlantic satellite imagery, you can see the three systems that we're pretty much tracking at this point. You can see Ida there, which is currently passing through Cuba after it made landfall just minutes ago. And then of course, 97 and 98L there. Uh, 97L isn't exactly looking the best, while 98L is continuing to get itself more and more organized. Uh, in the Eastern Pacific, you can see what is there of Nora. It's relatively large, of course, you're going to have to ignore the relatively noticeable satellite glitches that have been increasingly there the last few uh, days. Hopefully this gets resolved soon, but you can still see the relatively large size of it nonetheless. In the Western Pacific, you can see that there's really not much of anything going on. It's just clouds really and some showers and thunderstorms that really pretty much exist throughout naturally uh, sort of the basin nothing that's going to be spinning up into a tropical cyclone anytime soon here so best to say that it's going to be quiet for the rest of august here no worries for any of the west pacific land masses in the north indian ocean there's really not much going on if at all as well it's the average monsoonal season so you're not looking at the bay of bengal uh, where you have all that shower activity going on in the Arabian Sea, which is pretty much quite the opposite. So, uh, the tale of two things continues for that one. And looking at our most discussed topic for tonight, Hurricane Ida, which is posing a significant threat to the Gulf Coast, where a Category 4 landfall is now expected as this continues to parallel uh, the Florida coast at least once it does get there and then it will of course be making its way towards Louisiana. In the eastern Pacific sea surface temperatures look like this. We're looking at around 28 to 29 degrees Celsius temperatures throughout the majority of the basin. Some areas where it's only 27 and the Baja Peninsula and areas pretty much inwards in the Gulf of California around 30. Gulf of Mexico around 30 to 32 degrees Celsius where Ida will be tracking in 28 to 29 for the majority of the basin as well. And of course those 30 to 32 degrees Celsius temperatures in the Gulf of Mexico are definitely going to help provide a great boost for Ida's intensity. You can still see what's left of Grace's uh, impact there of course as well. And looking at the North Indian Ocean uh, sea surface temperatures, you can see 28 to 29 degrees Celsius for the Bay of Bengal, and then those temperatures drop off as you head westward into the Arabian Sea. And the Western Pacific looks like this, 30 degrees Celsius temperatures continuing across portions of the South China Sea and Philippine Sea, and of course areas near the equator as well. So that is what we're looking at that. In terms of where we are in terms of the sea surface temperature anomalies, 
Uh, those will be showing up in a second here, and you can see that the Atlantic and Western Pacific remain generally above average, about 1 to 2 degrees or more. Uh, the high latitudes and subtropics are looking extremely warm, especially south of Alaska and near the Gulf Stream, so definitely interesting there. So with that, this is the latest cone from the National Hurricane Center. Of course, this came out around 7 minutes ago, and as of right now, we're looking at this storm located at 22.4 degrees north, 83.5 degrees west. It's got winds of 80 miles an hour. Uh, we also agree here at Force 13 with 80 miles an hour, pretty much in line with this uh, for the last day or so now. And as of right now, they are, of course, indicating this will reach 140 miles an hour before this makes landfall uh, in Louisiana. And then we're going to be seeing a significant slowdown. So heavy rainfall, storm surge, damaging winds, definitely all in play here. Um, unfortunately, this is definitely going to be the strongest system of the year. We already dealt with Grace not even a week ago, and that was already the first major this season. And now we're looking at this. Louisiana, of course, has dealt with too much. Uh, this would be yet another major landfall for them. Joining the coverage tonight, we have quite a bit of people. We have Dakota, we have Isaac, Sam, Jonesy, Kay, Mark, as well as Euxinator. How are you guys today? Yeah, all right. Doing okay. Um, so it's been a long week, and this is a storm that... Uh, you know, the Atlantic's been, it's been getting ready for this, and, you know, let's just hope um, nothing bad can happen from this. But right now, it's um, currently, um, I believe it's mostly over Cuba, and it's passing through Cuba right now, but once it hits the Gulf, um, basically, we'll have to keep a really close eye on it. Yeah, for sure. Going over the warnings that we currently have in effect, at least the watches and warnings, there is a storm surge warning for east of Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge, Louisiana, to the Mississippi-Alabama border. There's also a storm surge warning for Vermilion Bay, Lake Borg, Lake Pontchartrain, and Lake Morepas. A hurricane warning is in effect for the Cuban provinces of uh, Pinar del Rio and Artisma, or Artemisa, as well as the Isle of Youth. There's also a hurricane warning for intercoastal city Louisiana to the mouth of the Pearl River, as well as one for Link Pontchartrain, Lake Maripas, and Metropolitan New Orleans. Uh, looking at the storm surge watch, we have one for Sabine Pass to Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge, Louisiana, as well as Mobile Bay. Uh, a hurricane watch that is in effect from Cameron, Louisiana to west of Intracoastal City, Louisiana, as well as a hurricane watch for the mouth of the Pearl River to the Mississippi-Alabama border. Uh, going over the tropical storm warning that is in effect for the Cuban provinces of Matanzas, Mayabeque, as well as Havana, as well as a tropical storm warning for Cameron, Louisiana, to west of Intracoastal City, Louisiana, and then of course we also have one for the mouth of Pearl River to the Mississippi-Alabama border. A tropical storm watch is in effect for the Mississippi-Alabama border to the Alabama-Florida uh, border, so definitely a lot going on right now. And going over the storm surge amounts... Um, those are going to be significant as well. Um, if you are, are areas near Sabine Pass going all the way to Pecan Island, two to four feet storm surge for there. Pecan Island, the Intracoastal City, three to five foot storm surge. And then from Intracoastal City to Morgan City, that is a six to nine foot storm surge. Of course, this includes Vermilion Bay. And then really the most significant of this would be from Morgan City all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi River, going all the way upwards in a little bit. There, a 10 to 15 foot storm surge is possible. Yeah, and storm surge, um, as we know, um, is by far the um, most destructive and I guess the deadliest part of the storm. Um, and this is going to be a real test for the le levees um, in. Louisiana, specifically New Orleans, with this new levy that they put in place, um, this is going to be a really good test to see how these levees go, depending on if the storm stays on the current track or not, because it could, because the track could change at any given time. And of course, that's on the only areas that could be seeing surge, just going eastward even from then. You're still looking at a 7 to 11 foot storm surge from the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, 
northwards. Uh, Lake Pontchartrain, four to seven foot storm surge. Lake Maripas, three to five foot storm surge. And then pretty much run the mouth of the Mississippi River all the way to Ocean Springs, four, uh, seven to 11. Uh, o Ocean Springs to the Mississippi Alabama border, we're looking at four to seven foot storm surge. Mobile Bay, as well as the Mississippi Alabama border to the Alabama Florida border, that it could be seeing two to four foot of storm surge. And of course, even if you're west and east of those storm surge locations, rip currents are definitely going to be something to weigh on the lookout for. And if that wasn't bad enough, we're also looking at the rainfall impacts with this. Um, not a pull up, but I can with that. Uh, Dakota's. Your internet's not that great, so I can't pull it. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is the latest rainfall from the Weather Prediction Center in terms of what we could be seeing. It's a little bit blurry, but uh, I can always explain what areas could be seeing. Uh, those pink amounts, those are definitely going to be something that you really need to be concerned about. 15 to 20 inches of rain in those pink regions, and that does include uh, the western areas of New Orleans. Uh, red areas, of course, no areas that could be seeing 10 to 15 inches, and that pretty much encompasses much of the southeastern area of Louisiana, as well as parts, uh, portions of Mississippi there. Orange areas denote areas that could be seeing 6 to 10 inches of rain. That does include Jackson, Mississippi, Mobile, Alabama. Uh, so if you near, live near any of those, there's going to be some really heavy rainfall amounts you could be seeing there. Uh, those yellow areas, two to four inches of rain, or four to six inches of rain, excuse me, and that area includes Memphis, Tennessee, even. So, and we know that Tennessee does not need any rain after the significant flooding that they've been seeing. So, not good that we're seeing rain uh, that heavy there. Uh, two to four inches of rain across areas like Nashville, Birmingham, as well as Lake Charles, and that and areas pretty much in extreme southeastern Texas. So. A uh, wide swath of heavy rainfall totals, and doesn't end there. Areas that could be seeing 1 to 2 regardless include Shreveport, Little Rock, um, Chattanooga, and of course there's also Montgomery as well. Birmingham, Alabama could be seeing 2 to 4 inches of rain as well. So a very serious situation we're looking at on all sides of this between how destructive the winds are going to be, how strong the surge is going to be. I mean, 10 to 15 foot is not something to joke about. And then of course we're looking at 15 to 20 inches of rain uh, that is not a good combo at all when you put all three of those together. And of course, uh, we're all looking at the Weather Prediction Center. They've already issued a moderate risk of excessive rainfall. This is for day three, of course, so this is not exactly the full extent as to the areas that we'll be seeing any kind of Weather Prediction Center excessive rainfall outlook from this. But you can already see that a relatively large portion of the coastal areas that will be seeing the worst of impacts are already under moderate risk. Uh, New Orleans is already in that 20% risk there for rainfall that could easily lead to flash flooding, which is entirely understandable given the magnitude of the rainfall we could be seeing. And I really wouldn't be surprised if this goes a higher risk, especially with this kind of rainfall and the fact that Louisiana and Mississippi for sure have already seen a wetter than normal season in terms of uh, what we've observed with the storms and all. They did mention at the last day three update at 2030Z that a high risk outlook is possible in future outlooks. Yeah, there you go. Pretty much just something extremely significant there in terms of that aspect. I mean, you got Lake Charles is in there. Of course, they already have dealt with enough from uh, Laura, of course, from last year. Thankfully, it's only a uh, marginal risk, but of course, if everything expands and they could easily be placed in the slight risk for that. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi, Mobile, Alabama are in that uh, slight risk for excessive rainfall leading to flash flooding. So just something to be watching in general. Uh, Dakota, can you pull up the key messages for this so that we can go over the, always the prominent things that people need to be taken away and we can go over what should be, you know, done. Alright, so this is the key messages for Hurricane Ida. Of course, this was updated at 5 p.m., and the next uh, key messages release will be around 11. And pretty much, there's a lot to take away from this. I'll break it down point by point. Uh, we're looking at a life-threatening storm surge and hurricane conditions that are expected to continue through tonight in portions of western Cuba, including the Isle of Youth, where hurricane warning is in effect. Life-threatening heavy rains, flash flooding, and mudslides are expected across Jamaica, the Cayman Islands, as well as the western Cuba, and including the Isle of Youth. So, of course... Cuba impacts are currently ongoing, as to be expected, given the fact that this did just make landfall not too long ago. Um, and unfortunately, land really won't be impacting it, if at all. So we've already seen that no weakening has occurred at all uh, over the Isle of Youth, and of course that's not likely going to be occurring over 
Cuba, especially with recent trends either. Uh, so not good news with that. And um, needless to say, of course, surge is obviously going to be as much as a threat as the U.S. There's always going to be storm surge when you look at a landfall. Um, so those in the hurricane warnings and tra uh, tropical storm warnings in uh, Cuba right now are pretty much seeing the impacts that they're going to be seeing from this. Uh, of course, it will be moving out overnight and into the morning hours of tomorrow. Uh, breaking down that second point from the key messages, there's a danger of life-threatening storm surge inundation Sunday along the coast of Louisiana and Mississippi within the storm surge warning area. Extremely life-threatening inundation of 10 to 15 feet above ground level is possible within the area from Morgan City, Louisiana to the mouth of the Mississippi River. Interest throughout the warning area should follow any advice given by local officials. Um, of course, there's already been several evacuations that have been given across areas of coastal Louisiana and uh, other regions, of course, especially with the fact that the storm surge is just going to be extremely severe and the fact that this is for sure life-threatening. You definitely do not want to be in the path of those, and it's definitely understandable why evacuation orders are being placed. Um, the third point, Ida is expected to be an extremely dangerous major hurricane when it reaches the coast of Louisiana. Hurricane force winds are expected Sunday in portions of the hurricane warning area along the Louisiana coast, including metropolitan New Orleans, with potentially catastrophic wind damage possible where the core of Ida moves on shore. Actions to protect life and property should be rushed to completion in the warning area. Uh, so you can really tell how much they are going to bat with this. This is some very strong words that the National Hurricane Center is releasing. And it is possible that these words can be uh, made stronger as we get closer to this thing. This is a very, very serious threat that we're looking at here. And with this being a Category 4 at landfall, of course, the last one to make landfall uh, as a Category 4 in Louisiana was Laura of last year. And we really don't need a repeat of... Uh, anyone who didn't take the necessary actions with that storm. Of course, while it may landfall in a less populated zone, this isn't the same exact case this time. This is making landfall in eastern Louisiana this time rather than western. Uh, so not good news with that either. Um, Ida is likely to produce heavy rainfall later Sunday to Monday across the central Gulf Coast from southeastern Louisiana to coastal Mississippi and Alabama, resulting in considerable flash, urban small stream, and riverine flooding impacts. As Ida moves inland, Flooding impacts are possible across portions of the lower Mississippi and Tennessee valleys. And of course, these areas have already seen quite a bit of rain already. They don't need the rain, and unfortunately, it is um, uh, what it is, and it's going to be a significant amount of rain for these areas. So, really need to be making sure that you do take uh, actions if you're riding the storm out or if you're far inland, because even though the storm may reach you as a much weaker system, especially the further you are inland, that doesn't mean that's going to be the case with the rain. Of course, they talked about how there's a pretty good swath of areas that are going to be seeing over 2 to 4 inches of rain, and a good swath of areas that could be seeing 4 to 6 even further inland into parts of southwestern Tennessee. And we all know that there was a large historic tor uh, Tennessee flooding event that happened not too long ago, so it's really just making sure that uh, you have an I a way to receive flood alerts, any kind of alerts in general. And needless to say, now that these watches have now become hurricane warnings, this is the time to make sure that all preparedness actions are rushed to completion as soon as humanly possible. Um, not sure if anyone else in the team wanted to make their remarks on what they uh, feel about Ida right now, but if you want to, you can do go ahead and say what you think. I think it's just um, remarkable just to see uh, the size of this magnitude. I'm scared to definitely think of what could happen, but I mean, there's still two days to refine that. But what you were saying about the storm surge, like you said, 10 to 15 foot storm surge by just eastern Louisiana, um, 7 to 11 by New Orleans, not too far from New Orleans, possible 10 foot and that rainfall. 15 to 20 feet. I'm just um, scared to see what could happen. I just 15 to 20 inches seems like a lot, but I'm just like I said, people should definitely take precautionary measures. We still have some time, but people should definitely be taking the precautions seriously. 
And it's not that you just have 50 to 20 inches of rain. When you combine that with the other factors, between the fact that we're going to be... Storm surge, too, yeah. It, it, it's a really serious situation we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, uh, we have our CDPS, the Cycle Destruction Potential Scale, and the latest uh, fix for that puts us now into CDPS Stage 7. Uh, of course, that does put us well into the life-threatening side of things now. Of course, that starts at CDPS Stage 6, and now that this is a 7, uh, just not good news at all. Um, K, I I don't know if you're still here, but uh, if you wanted to go over what could be the impacts that are helping the CDPS be as high as it is. Um, yeah, that is if you're here. He's Stefan. Oh. Anyways, um, what we're looking at in terms of the CDPS, we've got a... Get trying to get those numbers up right now so that way I can, you know, give the right information. So basically, as of right now, there's a stage 5 for Cuba uh, with the CDPS. This is mainly for the winds being on the significant side of things, the storm size is relatively moderate, and the rainfall, of course, being a major threat with the uh, totals up to 15 to 20 inches possible there. Um, and that puts the overall threat there, of course, at a stage 5. Uh, Louisiana has a stage 7. Uh, that is for the wind being between major and extreme. Uh, the storm size uh, from between significant and major, the rainfall threat, of course, is going to be major with the high rainfall totals. Uh, so that easily puts us at a stage 7 there. Um, and although we haven't explicitly mentioned it much, we also have uh, Nora, uh, which of course is a tropical storm and is threatening the Baja California Peninsula. That is also a stage 5 at the moment. Uh, we'll see what goes on with that system. Uh, but needless to say... We, we we really looking at two potentially serious situations, of course. Uh, stage 5 and 7 actively at the same time uh, between the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific is just uh, two really bad scenarios. And of course, uh, if you want to pull up the cone for Nora, Dakota, so that we can at least touch on that briefly. Waiting for that to load. So uh, here is the latest advisory. It's now 65 miles an hour from the National Hurricane Center, and it is expected that it does uh, reach hurricane strength over the next 12 to 24 hours. Uh, where tropical storm warnings are currently in place with the extraordinarily large wind field associated with this storm, um, and it is expected that it does pretty much make a run for going as far into the Baja or the Gulf of California there as possible without making landfall, which is not a track that I'm really familiar with seeing, because that's not exactly the most common track you see in the Eastern Pacific, especially not for August. Uh, so, really interesting what's going on there. Um, as of right now, they do have this peaking at 90 miles an hour, uh, with the weakening finally down to tropical storm strength as it uh, gets towards the northern end of Mexico. Uh, relatively weird that I'm having to say this, but that that is basically what we're looking at here. Uh, the large size will be helping it in a way, but needless to say, if you are in Mexico or in the Baja California coast there, you definitely need to be uh, monitoring the situation closely. Um, thankfully, its own size should prevent it from, you know, rapidly intensifying as fast as what we're going to be seeing with Ida, of course. But regardless, it is still going to be a hurricane, a high-end category 1 by the looks of things. Uh, so you definitely want to be treating this as a serious threat, of course. Um, and you can really just see, the orange in the map, of course, denotes the wind field of this thing. It is massive, to say the least, for an eastern Pacific storm. Um, and then, of course, we're going to switch it back over to the Cuban radar, and that is pretty much showing that um, while it made landfall not too long ago, it's already over halfway done traversing the Cuban Islands. So, of course, this will be emerging back over water the next hour or two. Uh, and once that occurs, it's basically the end game for this thing. As much as I hate to use that term for any kind of tropical cyclone, this is not going to be something that is going to remain weak. Uh, between the fact that wind shear is going to be relatively low, sea surface temperatures are going to be extremely warm, oceanic heat content, this thing is going to be surpassing the highest amount that exists in the Gulf of Mexico. 
it, it, everything's building up for this, and that's why the National Hurricane Center forecast and our forecast have been uptrending. Of course, the only deviation from the National Hurricane Center that we have is that we are forecasting a 145-mile-an-hour storm uh, before it makes landfall. And needless to say, it's, it's going to be a significant storm, no, no matter what intensity it reaches. A 5-mile-an-hour difference does not really change much, especially when you look at the uh, aspect side of things. This is going to be an extremely dangerous, life-threatening storm if you're not taking the necessary precautions. If you are in an evacuation zone, please e do the necessary things and, of course, evacuate. Uh, I saw something that was issued by some of the National Weather Service local offices earlier, and they were basically saying that potential impacts were devastating to catastrophic, widespread deep inundation from storm surge flooding, structural damage to buildings with many washing away, uh, damage greatly compounded from considerable flooding debris, and locations may be uninhabitable uh, for an extended period. So the fact that we have National Weather Service areas basically calling it uninhabitable, possibly, uh, in some locations, it, it, it's just extreme. It's serious. It's something not to take lightly. It's why I'm stressing that if you are not, ha if you have not taken the steps to prepare for this, now is the time. You're running out of time. You've only got about 24 hours left uh, before some of the impacts start coming on Sunday. Things get deteriorate Sunday night. This makes landfall, and then of course this brings in a significant rainfall threat with that. So you don't want to be wasting your time. Um, on top of that, near shore escape routes and secondary roads washed out or severely flooded. Flood control systems and barriers may become stressed. Extreme shoreline erosion. New shoreline cuts are possible. Uh, massive damage to marinas, docks, boardwalks, and piers. Numerous small craft broken away from moorings with many lifted on shore and stranded. So basically, if you have any coastal uh, modes of transportation or any kind of coastal... Uh, house or building or any kind of business there you need to basically get out of there make sure that things are all stocked up and all that stuff uh, and just leave you don't want to be near the coast for this storm it's the worst thing um, you can do yes and um, I do also bring up a point I'm not sure if you guys mentioned this already but um, there's just been a reported fatality already from the storm due to the rip currents, which is another threat that the storm brings. Um, as rip currents will be affect, um, will be affect, like it'll affect the rip currents of the areas. And um, there was a rip current death. Um, all the way in Escambia County, which I highly doubt was due to the storm, but um, it's just a precursor as to what could come. And um, it's why you need to stay off of the beaches whenever you can. Um, and, yeah, make sure that, um, you, yeah, especially during a very strong storm like this, you don't want to be on a beach um, trying to get film on it. Um, so. Yeah, of course, none of us here wanted to go uh, think that this could be a reality, but unfortunately, this uh, we, we, we looked at this last night, um, and we pretty much said if this doesn't get organized, then pretty much Category 3 would remain the forecast for this thing. And we also said that if this did become a hurricane before Cuba, we'd have a significant problem on our hands, um, and this reached hurricane strength before it hit Cuba, and now we are looking at a much more massive problem than we initially realized. Category 4 landfall is supported by all the models at this point. Uh, many of them, if you pretty much factor in the, the lo fact that many of them initialized too high, uh, would pretty much end up with the Category 4 landfall uh, on the dot. So pretty much, this is not something to joke around with. This is not something to take lightly. Uh, those who are in the path need to take action now. Um, we are, of course, now at the half-hour mark, and at this point, with the uh, massive uh, amount of comment or chats that we're seeing, if you have any questions for us, please tag us at Force 13. That will pop our name up in orange, and we will be able to answer questions. Of course, we have significant live coverage planned, uh, a lot more tomorrow than what we had today, so um, stay on the tune for that. If you like our content, of course, be sure to subscribe. Uh, because, of course, we do have storm updates, uh, live events, a lot of things planned. As long as this system remains as significant as a threat, 
uh, as it is, and that is going to be definitely staying into the weekend, so uh, we will be seeing what goes on with that. Um, seems that we've already got quite a few questions on our end. Uh, first one, where are you expecting landfall? I'd say central Louisiana is the best go right now. Central eastern Louisiana coastline. I would not put an estimate on to where, honestly, I would not put an estimate to where it's going to be landfall this far out. Um, I Because the path could easily deviate completely. So I would put in a range, frankly, and the range I'd put in would be from as central, yeah, central Louisiana is a good starting point, but I think that it could also make landfall in eastern Louisiana or it at the extreme, possibly in Mississippi, though that's very unlikely. Again, that would be if the storm really, really strengthens, and which would cause the storm to go a bit further east. So, um, looking at the cone right now, uh, it looks like they are predicting any landfall anywhere between south of Lake Arthur and pretty much into Port Sol for Louisiana. Um, as of right now, they take the center right over Morgan City. Uh, Louisiana. So that is what we're looking at in terms of that. Um, and let's see here. Next question. Uh, that was LOL. Did Ida do the unthinkable and pull a brown ocean effect and strengthen over the land? I think it did. I, I'm not 100% sure about it, but it did look like it was. Um, but it, um, it looked like some hot towers or some convection was um, firing. In the yeah, convection was really firing off. And this would make this the third storm this year to do something like this. Yeah, it's been a, quite an odd year with, in terms of intensifying, uh, intensifying storms for sure. Um, another question that we had. Uh, YouTube chat kind of glitched on me for a second there. Um... When should Ida emerge off of the Cuban coast? Also, do you have any thoughts on the convection burst over the center of the storm? Uh, by the looks of things, it looks like it will be emerging off the coast in the next hour or two at the most. Uh, and that's where the real uh, game will begin for this system, of course. Uh, not sure what the team has in terms of thoughts with uh, the convection blow-up. I mean, I think we kind of just covered that is with the... Uh, intensifying over land question there uh, although I, this has been maintaining intensity I wouldn't say it's strengthening uh, it's at, at the very least maintaining uh, but once this does exit the coast it will likely be strengthening immediately again yeah and I mean uh, I'm not I'm not sure how like the conditions in the Gulf um, they will definitely be um, they will definitely be suitable for um, rapid intensification, um, but it's just a matter of if the storm actually does, which the likelihood is, it, it probably, well, especially once it gets into the warmer regions closer to Louisiana. And, he, and here with this graphic is the ocean heat content that we're, uh, that is in the Atlantic, of course, and if you look at, uh, the path this is, it's basically going over the highest amounts of ocean heat content uh, that there is. Uh, oh, over 100 uh, kilojoules a centimeter s squared there, so just s serious there. That is not good. Yeah, and the fact that it intensified as fast as it did before it made that first um, before Cuba and managed to make landfall at with winds of 80 miles per hour that already leaves a big issue because that means that the initial hope for the system was that it would be so disorganized, like a lot of the storms we've seen so far this year, it would be so disorganized that once it got into those suitable conditions, it would take a while for itself to finally get its act together and then it would strengthen and maybe impact as a somewhere like a category two, like the initial forecast was. But because it is done what we exactly didn't want it to do and that is of course strengthen and get itself very well organized before landfall in cuba and keep it after landfall in cuba especially since it's not going to be over cuba for very long um that is a big problem and that's why we are in the situation we are in right now 
Yes, and I do want to quickly mention that um, for those evacuating in um, Louisiana, fish, um, I do want to mention that um, I hope you guys got gas because I'm hearing that the gas there, um, yeah, it's not looking, the situation's not good. And if, um, if you're in those areas, especially in New Orleans, evacuate. Um, I would not, like, yeah, it's going to be the test for the levees, like I mentioned earlier, but we, um, but the levees, um, even with those levees, it's still not 100% certain that the levees will um, be safe. Um, so, I did hear, actually, that um, if, depending on how strong the storm gets, there are some levees that could end up um, failing, especially in the Terrebonne Parish, um, which is where mandatory evacuations have been put into place. So. Yep, good calls, of course. Another question that we had was, how does Ida compare to Camille of 1969? Uh, at least from a standpoint here, the track, definitely similar. Yeah, and that's something we don't like seeing at all. Um, not definitely not saying this is going to reach the intensity that Camille, of course, did back in 69, where, of course, it became one of the strongest Atlantic storms to make landfall. Um, but in terms of its track and its path, it's not really too far off. I would also like to add to that levees question. Um, even if the levees don't break, you still have a massive internal flooding issue because of that rainfall graphic we saw. Um, 15 plus inches of rainfall very likely over New Orleans, so there's a pretty good chance that even if the levees don't break, you're still going to see some flooding there. Yeah, it's going to be really serious in terms of what we're going to be seeing there. Uh, next question. Uh, update to the Hurricane Hunters. Has there been any update on recon uh, in the last few, or the last half hour in general? That is, if anyone knows. Uh, I think there's one that's on its way to the storm. I'm not sure about the other, um, the NOA. Plane, but I know there is a plane that is heading towards storm. I believe at the moment. Um, as for if the other plane is still there, I have no idea. Yeah, I hope we can get an answer on that again shortly. Um, Oz, this goes to a category five at this point. Not zero. Yeah, that's all we can really say. Um, the chances are not. 0%, which is not something I want, like, saying, but, um, they aren't big. Like, it's small. Small chance. I mean, I'd say it's too early to ask those questions, because exactly. asking... This is not the time to argue whether or not this is a Category 5, and that's something I really hate happening, because what we need to really be focused on is not some arbitrary number, it's the fact that these are going to change people's lives forever if this goes the way that we think it's gonna go. And that's something that we should be way more focused on than whether or not this thing has a chance of becoming a Category 5. I mean, I agree with you, Athelia. I agree with you, because, um, especially because it's still over Cuba, and, you know, it's going to be getting off of um, Isle Cuba in a bit, and we'll be able to see what it does afterwards. But for now, um, um, predicting that stuff, um, yeah, not right now. Until the NHC does it, well, basically, until we say it, or until the NHC says that there's a sizable chance, then we can start discussing that. Yeah. But right now, that's currently not up for discussion right now. Yeah, the chances um, are definitely not zero. Of course, we'll be monitoring what happens, uh, but needless to say, there's a good shot of uh, this definitely becoming Category 4. Um... That is what we're forecasting, of course, but as of right now, I don't really think it's really safe to place bets on what's going to happen. Either yeah, way, yeah. it's going to be a very catastrophic landfall at the current side of things. And you have some news regarding Ida. Um, it is starting to now exit Cuba at this moment. So... Yeah, and so this is where it all starts to go downhill from here. Yep. This is the uh, part that will determine what, what, how much will I to strengthen, how much will it go up to. 
a lot of answers that are going to be uh, answered in the next 24 to 36 hours as this gets itself uh, used to the Gulf of uh, Mexico, of course, and this is really going to be something that evolves much more further than what we already have. So, uh, very significant situation developing, and it's going to get really worse in the next uh, 24 to 36 hours, especially as rapid intensification begins. Um, you were going to say something? And what I wanted to say was that um, basically this storm, I believe, um, the, like it won't be a small moving storm at all. It's going to be moving quite fast, even over the Gulf of Mexico. So, um, yeah, but it it won't be moving so fast to where the convection yeah. can't keep up with it, like what happened exactly. with Elsa earlier this year. So that isn't going to happen. Yeah. It's still going to have about two days in the Gulf of Mexico, and even then, once it makes landfall, that's when it's going to slow down, and that's when it's going to become a serious issue. Yeah, and so once after landfall, that's when that flooding risk really is a big problem. And I would like to go back to that rainfall graphic, especially the three-day outlook. It's extremely rare for a moderate to be put three days in advance, I should add. I think they did that for Henri, or they did it for day two, I'm not sure. They did but it for Henri for day three. Yeah, but that's still quite rare from what I've noticed making graphics. And so that really just gives kind of an indicator of how serious the seri this uh, situation's becoming. Um, uh, let's see here to try we've got quite a more bit of questions here. Uh GFS looks initializing more west of where the center is right now. Could this mean a more eastern track? Uh, I wouldn't really would call it such. The GFS did initialize 15 millibars too weak. Um, so I don't really know. Of course, this could shift east where the cone has been slowly shifting towards the east. But as of right now, um, if you're wondering whether this is going to be making a landfall in, say, Mississippi or uh, near the Mississippi-Alabama border, it's not out of the question, but it doesn't seem likely at the moment. I would like to point out that in um, the live discussion chat that Ethan had s states that the 00 ATCF is 80 miles per hour, 985 millibars. So that means as that, it exits out, it's weakened zero. Yeah, and that is exactly what we didn't want to have happen. Yeah, because I know that uh, when we discussed this on the stream of what impacts the uh, Isle of Youth and then, of course, Cuba would have... And we were all figuring, like, okay, 5 to 10 miles an hour, probably, in terms of how much to weaken. And, yeah, that was ending up being zero. So, not good news there. Um, hopefully, this isn't the beginning of what could potentially be a very historic hurricane, even though it already might as well be. Well, of course, we got to hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and that is definitely this words that um, the Nash, uh, the Gulf Coast should be listening to at the moment. Um... What is the worst case scenario for Ida? Um, really, at this point, all I have to say is Camille 2.0. That's basically the worst case scenario that could potentially happen, especially with the track of it. Um, I'd even I, go one step further and say Katrina 2.0. No, no, Katrina. The issue, the reason why I don't like comparing this to Katrina is that Katrina's main issue is that the infrastructure in New Orleans was so poorly made that the levees collapsed. We aren't going to see an issue where almost all the well, levees yeah, in New I Orleans I don't think the levees collapsed. The, the levees aren't going to collapse again, but I'm talking about surge wise, wind speed wise, track wise. Right. I, I don't I, think the levees are going to collapse again this time. We've definitely, um, and also it's coming up on literally supposed to make landfall to the 16 years to the day that Katrina did. Um, but um, that's the similarities to Katrina. Uh, but the levees aren't going to collapse. <coughs> we, we've had so many technological advances in the past 16 years that I don't think the levees are going to collapse again. But uh, when it comes to impact-wise, so tornadoes, rainfall, surge, wind speed, uh, worst case scenario is Katrina or Camille 2.0 or worse. Okay. I know some of the models are trying, but these are the more outlandish models. Some of them are trying to uh, hint at 190 plus one of them even said the nan three kilometer even said 200 plus uh i don't think it's gonna get that strong 
So right now I'm going to say worst case scenario would be Camille Katrina 2.0. But uh, when it comes to wind speed and all that, I don't think the levees are going to collapse again. Uh, but I would not leave those outlandish models out of the realm of possibility. I'm not saying it's fully impossible, but it's very unlikely. I'm going to say less than a half percent that it gets that it gets even up to that strong. All right. Um, yeah. I just I, I, I we're just going to continue getting through questions that we're not uh, keeping up on. You know the worst possibilities. Of course, this is not what we're forecasting. I just want to make that clear right here, right now. Um, we're not forecasting a Category 5 right now, of course, um, and that would be the worst case scenario. Cat category 5, of course, that's always the worst case scenario with some of the storms that you see in the Gulf, especially with this high of oceanic heat content and environmental conditions, but right now we're sticking to our forecast of Category 4, and uh, until enough evidence suggests such, then we are, are going to be remaining such. So um, don't take our worst case scenario as something that's going to actually pan out. Uh, don't take the best case scenario and ask, think that's going to be something that pans out because as of right now the best case scenario is that it reaches cat 3 uh, that is basically the best case scenario for this and that's even then that's extremely severe regardless um, is I expected as oh that my YouTube chat went, went down again um, I do want to mention uh, something real quick in regards to evacuation efforts because I know evacuation efforts are basically um, you're going to have uh, it seems we lost off area there. Yeah, I, I think there's... Um, no going time. through, uh, do you think this has a chance of going through an Iowa replacement cycle in the Gulf? I mean, any storm has that's a hurricane has a chance of going through an Iowa replacement cycle, really. Uh, if it does, that makes it worse because that's going to mean the tropical storm force and the hurricane force wind fields are just going to expand uh, slightly and get a little bit bigger, which means more people are likely to get impacted, uh, which is not which is not a good thing at all. But there is it's it's normal for them to go under iron wall replacement cycles. Usually, all these uh, all the storms do. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we see an iron wall replacement cycle or two when it gets into the Gulf. I do want to quickly answer a question from the chat, which asks why um people think that this storm seems like a surprise um it's not that this storm was a surprise necessarily it was more like the fact of how fast it intensified we were not thinking it would do intensify this quickly um so um yeah, originally the idea was, of course, obviously from the first come, was that it was expected to, you know, make a mid-range tropical storm landfall in Cuba and then get near major hurricane intensity uh, as it headed towards, you know, Louisiana and all. And um, unfortunately got itself organized a lot quicker than what we initially expected to. Uh, it was the worst case scenario as to what we could have expected in the Caribbean, and pretty much that panned out a lot worse than what we had initially thought would happen and of course uh, now we're looking at the reality that we're facing as a result of this category 4 national hurricane center going with 140 miles an hour um, so needless to say it's just re uh, really significant what we're seeing right now um, as a result of what happened in the organization stages yeah and I do want to mention in regards to the evacuation I remember first time I mentioned something about COVID that it didn't really go well but since we are talking about evacuation I feel like it is somewhat important to mention this now. We are still in the middle of a pandemic so please keep that in mind whenever you're making evacuation efforts. So anything and anything health wise if you are in Louisiana and you're like have a doctor's appointment or something cancel it right now. So you still want to be safe. And evacuating is one thing, but we also need to keep in mind the entirety of the health crisis that we are dealing with right now at the same time. Um, and speaking on the evacuations, they have mandatory out for the areas outside the levees in New Orleans and most of the other areas in southeastern Louisiana and eastern Louisiana. Um, Nelson on the stream earlier was saying he was saying 50-50 on if they do a full mandatory evacuation. I know areas inside the levees, they were doing voluntary evacuations. Um, they would only have done mandatory if they were able to do contra flow, um, meaning, you know, on the interstates, you have going to and out of the city and the one going to the city 
goes out of the city. So both ways become outwards. That's what contraflow means. Uh, it's too late to do that. They can't turn that one around. So they're not doing a full mandatory evacuation. Um, that is not possible at this time, which is not good. Um, so they're going to only keep areas inside the levees at voluntary evacuation. However, if you're in an area in New Orleans or Eastern Louisiana, uh, that is outside levee protect protection, you need to get out. It's mandatory evacuations. We know the traffic is going to be bad. They've already came out and said it's too late to do contraflow. Um, you need to get out now before it, before it's too late. Yeah. I'd and say that before it's the too late, Mark, is Sunday. Um, ZOZ ships has come out. Um, does anyone want to read that? Which ships is it? Is it the ships that just says the entire world is ocean and doesn't take into account oh, land? Or no, is it's the rapid intensification is... probabilities. Okay. Um, I can take care of those real quick. As of right now, it looks like in the next uh, 12 hours, the chance of it increasing 20 knots is 46%. Uh, in a 24-hour time frame where it strengthens 25 knots, it's 70.2 percent. In a 24-hour time frame where it strengthens 30 knots, we're looking at 68.8 percent. Uh, in a 24-hour time frame where it strengthens 35 knots, a 53.8 percent chance there. And if you want to go even further, 24-hour time frame where it strengthens 40 knots, 44.9 percent. So that's mm, relatively high probabilities there. Uh, 36 hour time frame where it strengthens 45 knots is 47.9%. A 48 hour time frame where it strengthens 55 knots is 35.7%. And then of course a 65 knot increase in 72 hours is 25%. As of right now this of course is 70 knots. 65 would take it up to 135 knots. So 25% chance is what SHIPS is giving for this becoming a 155 mile an hour storm. So that is um, serious uh, concerns with that one, of course. Uh, filling us with questions, of course, we will be wrapping up here shortly as we are getting towards the top of the hour. Um, why does it always take so long for the JT... Oh, we're trying to keep on topic, but I don't. I, I honestly don't know the question as to why it takes JTWC sometimes so long. Um, um, what radar website are you guys using? Can you link the website to us? So we can see. Um, Isaac, if you want to go in the live chat or something like that and provide a link, that would be um, helpful. So that way, when those... we want to get closer to the U.S. Oh, go ahead. It's Cuba uh, in Semets. I'm gonna go uh, go share it in a second here. I uh, just wanted to quickly draw attention to one of the live cameras in Louisiana and uh, begin of everybody talking about evacuations. This is what's currently going on in Louisiana in terms of evacuations. Look at all that traffic heading away from this hurricane just incredible and this is i-10 where this is near the airport the loya airport and where is that in louisiana is that it's near near New it's Orleans? just to the west of um well, actually it's right right around uh materi or however you say that in uh, louisiana looks like cars are going to is that is that a city back there because that looks like skyscrapers or whatever i'm not up to up to date with my louisiana cities uh nelson would be more more okay. able to, to fully understand it. But um, yeah, it's just, this is pretty much just due west of Louisiana. Uh, not Louisiana, <laughs> due west of uh, New Orleans, I'm sorry. Orleans. And you can see all the traffic getting away from this hurricane. So you can see a lot of people were fortunately taking this threat seriously. Yeah, and as I said, so ContraFlow, uh, you see a um, bunch of cars going away. You don't really see traffic going for the ones going towards the camera. ContraFlow basically would mean you see those cars going towards the camera, uh, just flip them around. They would also be going away from the camera. Uh, so both both ways would be going in the same direction. So yeah. that that actually that's actually a, that visual is actually great for me to explain uh, what contraflow means. And I do want to say that this is a very good um, the fact that so many people are taking these evacuation precautions. I'm thinking. And as sad as it really is to say, I think it's because they've had so much, the state of Louisiana has had so much experience over the past decade or so with destructive hurricanes. I mean, even with Hurricane Isaac of 2012, there were still pretty big evacuations for that. And that was just a category one. And yeah. so 
I really want to say that in regards to that, it's re- it makes me somewhat happy and relieved that so many people this far out, even though it's all the way still in Cuba right now, it gives me so much relief that there are so many people that who are listening to the actions of not only us, but their local National Weather Service offices and their local governments saying, hey, we need to get out of here. Especially since what happened last year with Louisiana getting hit so hard by multiple tropical cyclones over and over again. And yep. so that's just, that's probably why, um, why so many people are evacuating. And I do want to, I know they probably aren't even watching, but if they, they I commend everyone who's doing this and taking this seriously. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we are, of course, getting towards the end of things here. And needless to say, uh, as Alferia mentioned there, it is definitely... Uh, a good thing to see that people are taking the necessary action. Uh, this is a very serious storm with very serious consequences for Louisiana. Uh, unfortunately, we are looking at a very extremely dangerous, life-threatening situation on our hands, and uh, no one needs to be uh, in, in. No one deserves to be in the path of this thing, really. And overall, oh, absolutely. And. Um. I'm sorry, I'll let you finish that thought. Well, say what you need to say, because I'm about to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm looking at I-10. Um, so, I-10 actually go from Baton Rouge, it goes down and around the lakes and actually into New Orleans, and then goes across over into Seidel. So, that's either what we're looking at is probably I-10 going towards New Orleans, but then it just it goes out. Um, back up, so um, over Lake Pontchartrain going more inland, although it stays along the coast line. So what we're probably seeing is it going towards New Orleans, and then it's going – so people are just going to go through New Orleans and then get out that way. Um, I-12 would be when – that's when I-10 splits when, when in Baton Rouge, and that goes on the north side of the lakes. This is probably the south side of the lakes because it says I-10. So – Regardless, they're all going in the right way where that traffic is. They're 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 getting out of harm's way um, because I-10 eventually gets out of New Orleans and it goes eastward towards Gulfport, Biloxi, Mobile, Pensacola, Tallahassee, and it goes all the way over to Jacksonville. Yeah, and needless to say, we're going to be keeping you guys covered uh, while we may be going off, uh, even though it's been one hour. Uh, we're going to be having a lot more coverage between several presenters. Uh, tomorrow and into Sunday, so of course we will be going a lot more overboard with the coverage uh, Just so that way we can make sure that people are stressing the need uh, and getting the information that they need because uh, This is definitely the biggest threat that we've seen so far in the Atlantic hurricane season so far And we're not going to be passing that uh, down at all. We will be covering this and we will be providing what you need to know uh, Needless to say finishing our coverage for the this tropical weather bulletin was Dakota Isaac Sam and Alferia, Jonesy, Mark, Uxinator, as well as myself presenting here tonight, Xavier Burns. Uh, and with that, we're going to go move on over to the On This Day. On This Day, uh, well, that didn't exactly go as planned. It loaded yesterday's. Fun. Okay, on the right on this day, this was for August 28th, 1985, where we were looking at a slew of systems active. Uh, Odessa, Pat, and Ruby are, were all closely together in the Western Pacific. Category 2 Odessa, Category 1 Pat, and Tropical Storm Ruby. Tropical Storm Olaf was existent in the Eastern Pacific. 17E would later become Pauline, and 5L would eventually become what would become an eventually well-known hurricane, Elena, 1985. Of course, that produced a very significant effect towards the Gulf Coast. Uh, you can find more of our On This Day products powered by Cyclone History. Their tag is on the Twitter below. But very active compared to what we're seeing right now, but either way, significant serious in situation regardless. Next name in the Atlantic is now Julian, followed by Kate. In the Eastern Pacific, we're looking out for Olaf and Pamela. And in the Central Pacific, while every kid can be a kid, every storm can't be a Hone, and we're still not looking out for that name anytime soon here. In the Western Pacific, the next name here is Kansan, followed by Chantu. And in the North Indian Ocean, we're looking out for Gulab and Shaheen. Oh. 
Um, hopefully I didn't make someone bash their head there with a the joke there. But uh, Australian region, we're looking out for Patty and Ruby. In the southwestern Indian Ocean, we're looking out for Anna and Batsy Ray. And in the South Pacific, it's Cody. Uh, with a whole lot of live coverage planned, uh, we will be seeing you on many of our streams in the coming future.